You went from having an exciting, awesome, fun day to within less than six hours thinking you were going to die. Thinking I was going to die. All right, so this is a story from a time in my life a number of years ago, um, and it came up because of a survival weekend that we were doing. A guy named Flight Chops, his information is going to be down in the link below, also at the end of the video. Flight Chops invited us to come along and really appreciate that he did because it reminded me how important this story was to me and survival and it's something to be taken seriously. So here's the story. So here we are at 5,300 feet above Widgeon Lake and about 200 feet down below me was a location that I built an ice rink on. We were almost finished. We had one day of work left. Trevin's actually the only guy to skate on an ice rink up here. And um, every two hours, the machine I was flying was a carburetor-equipped R44 Raven. And it was so Raven. It needed to get started every two hours, you know, to keep it warm. And I was doing that religiously, keeping the thing warm. And it's kind of weird when you're getting guys up there to help you work on something, and then you go sit in, every two hours, you go sit in the warm helicopter and, you know, run the engine for 20 minutes to get the helicopter warm. So we're getting ready to leave. It's about zero degrees. Um, uh, sun's still up, gorgeous day just like this, and uh, we've got about an hour and a bit till sunset, and um, and uh, it's getting cold, and I'm thinking, I gotta go start that machine. Like, it's, the temperature's starting to drop, I gotta go start that machine, but if I just help them with this and this, like, we could just all get out of here, you know, and, and I let the machine sit an extra probably 15, 20 minutes. Temperature dropped from around zero, qu pretty quickly got to down to about minus 10, and uh, we all jump in the helicopter, go to start, and eh, 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 won't start, won't catch fire. So we um, we get the snow blowers, um, get start trying to put the heat of the um, snow blower exhaust into the engine. I run to the edge of the lake, and so just to give you a sense of where we are right now, you know, I'm looking at down there. Like yeah, you can see home. I can see almost see my home airport. Yep. Um, if that mountain wasn't in the way, I'd be looking at my home airport. But I get cell reception here. I have, right now, I've got two bars of 3G, you know, like, and this is one of the reasons why I picked this area is because it's safe. Um, I can get cell reception. I can tell people if I have a problem. So I run to the edge of the lake. I call my mechanic. I say, can you come get me? Because he's with a helicopter company uh, two miles, three miles that way. He said, it, that temperature's dropping so fast. We put the machines away about 20 minutes ago. I've already left the airport. There's no way I'm going to get up there by legal. So I said, okay, no problem. We're committed to spending the night. Be here first light. Bring hand warmers, blankets, and hot chocolate. And we're going to need it, you know. Yeah. And bring tiger torches and stuff to help me get the machine started in the morning. So uh, that's the plan. I go back to trying to get the helicopter start. We try a few more times. Nope, not starting. We shift immediately into building survival. Pack everything down to the far end of the lake. There wasn't much snow that year. We couldn't build a proper snow cave and we wouldn't have it, had the time. We had shovels, we had um, 15 gallons of extra fuel, we had two snow blowers, we had a pallet, we had um, five fire logs, a tarp, um, we had an sur emergency survival kit underneath the seat, which we'll talk about later. <laughs> You know, we thought we had everything we need to spend the night. And I said to I said to one of the guys, we're pulling everything over. Uh, we had we had an axe and a hatchet. We had we had gear. We had stuff. And uh, I said to one of the guys, we're dragging everything over. I said, what what are the chances of us getting into trouble tonight? He goes, ah, we're fine. Like we got all the gear we need. We're we're fine. It's gonna suck, but we're fine. Well, temperature keeps dropping, 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 dropping. Gets down to about minus 25. And uh, again. Uh, coldest night in the history of Vancouver in February and we're stuck on the mountain and Arctic outflow winds are hitting. We were in a sheltered area but it would just come ripping through us. Temperatures dropping and winds are picking up and it's starting to suck. We put the pallet down, we used a natural feature of snow that was overhanging, put the pallet down, put the fire logs on a shovel, we were using the fire logs which were unfortunately melting that overhang a bit which was causing water to drip which was getting our legs wet which and this is all within less than three hours, right? Oh man, this like is like the rules of three, right? Three hours without proper shelter, and, and you're in real trouble. This is this is happening quick. Like so, you know, sun goes down at four o'clock. Um, by ten o'clock, we uh, one of the guys disappeared. So we had this um, bermed wall set up. 
and we had a tarp over top of it. And so we were kind of out of the, sun, uh, the wind. We had a pallet, so we were up off the snow. We had our survival kit. Um, we had those awesome reflective blankets that are supposed to keep you warm. And they, like, as soon as you wrap it around you, you're like, oh, yeah, okay, this is pretty good. But you're in this little cave with two other guys, and you're on a wooden pallet, and you move a little bit, and it, and it just, once you start a tear in that thing, it just runs. Like, yeah. it's like, next thing I know, I've got strips of aluminum. This fire is causing water to drip and drip onto my leg. One of the guys disappears for, like, 45 minutes. We're calling like where the hell did he went he took the hatch the hatchet and the axe and he scaled up the hill and he chopped down three trees and like green trees don't burn you know like this is this isn't a survival technique um we've got 15 gallons of fuel we're running our um, snowmobiles we're not turning them off we're keeping them and we're using the exhaust of the snowmobiles to heat our gloves to heat our boots and so on well one of the guys holds his gloves too long and the exhaust heats it up too much and actually melts a hole through his glove. So now our equipment's starting to fail. Um, you know, I'm in a bad situation. I'm getting wet, but I can't improve it by leaving. Realistically, what I should have done was we all should have gotten in the helicopter from the start, and we should have used this as our shelter. Right. You know, and it's funny because, like, you as a rational person, you're thinking, like, hey, we got to build this and stuff. Well, we had a shelter. But what we didn't also have was we didn't have a, um, a heat source for in here, a clean heat source. So we, but we probably wouldn't have torn our blankets, but we would have been out of the wind. So, you know, there's things we could have done that we would have done different, done better. But at the time you start getting really, really narrowed, focused. Finally at 10 o'clock in the evening, I said to the guys, I said, okay, this started at four. Draw a straight line from where we are at when we started this, the sense of adventure. This is going to be kind of cool. Draw a straight line to where we are at 10 o'clock now. Continue that line until 9 a.m., the earliest that a helicopter is coming to get us. Who are we eating? Where are we going to be? And um, they said, well, you're going to be hypothermic because you're getting wet. You're going to be in the hospital, and we're going to be pretty f***ed up, but we'll, we'll probably be okay. I said, okay, if this hockey sticks and it gets exponentially worse, where are we going to be? And they said, well, you're dead, <laughs> and we're both in the hospital. Yeah. And so it was like, that's kind of the math I did. And I said, okay, I'm going to go flip the ELTs, and my ELT is located right here. So I run over the helicopter, flip the ELT, and man, is it under, ever underwhelming when you flip this ELT to get rescued, this little red light goes beep. Yeah, it's like, <laughs> hopefully. Beep. And you, ex I, you expect the skies to part. Right, <laughs> I want this like, boom, 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 yeah. like, we're coming, don't yeah. worry. And there's no confirmation. Like, are they on a training mission? Are they, like, are they up tonight? Like, what's going on? Unbeknownst to me, as soon as I flip that, uh, phone calls are happening. Um, my emergency contact, Colin, who's the guy I called, is my mechanic. You know, he's telling them exactly where they are and confirming they have the right location. Um, they're calling my cell phone. Now my cell phone's dead. It's cold. You know, everything, all of our electronics are now dead. Um, can't make any phone calls to call for help. I'm trying to um, text message up until that point. I actually took like like probably 45 people that knew where I was. And I just did a mass text and said, we need help. Um, send. And like hoping that I'd get a... a, a no ball. Yeah, that I'd get something out. Yeah. But my um, before it died, it was just so cold that it wouldn't... Um, that it wouldn't... Um, it wasn't working. Oh, so it didn't send? So it you you saw this fail to send message? Yeah, I kept getting fail to send. Right? Oh, that's like so bad for morale. No confirmation that anybody's coming and this little blinking light. So I run back over to the camp and I said, guys, can you guys run over there and just make sure I, you think I did this right? Like, yeah. like that's my first time flipping the LT, right? So I do know if you flip it to on, yep. two hours later, a bunch of guys in a really awesome big helicopter will show up and they're super cool. I should have flipped that like four hours earlier. So now it's uh, 10 o'clock, and it's amazing. I don't know if it hockey stick because it got worse, got colder, got windier, got whatever, or that sense of defeat of we need to get rescue set in, and things just got exponentially worse, and um, everybody's shivering now. I'm getting to you know to a hypothermic level. We're um, just pouring gasoline onto the onto like these fire these pieces of wood, <laughs> you know, green trees that aren't burning. And, uh, yeah, it just got really desperate really quickly. They're looking, like, at planes going over, going, like, is that one? Is that one? I thought what was going to happen was a Buffalo aircraft was going to fly over at a low altitude and push sleeping bags out in a radio, and they'd come get us the next day. But, no. 
Cormorant helicopter comes over the over the ridge back that way, all lights blazing, and it was just like, <laughs> yeah. yeah, like your savior, right? Yeah, and they uh, they went by nine times, and they flew by nine freaking times, and again, like you start getting stupid. I've got a radio, my battery still works. Like I know one two one five zero. I should just run to the helicopter and go, hey guys, like you know, you see us and blah blah. blah. But they go by nine times. They packed on so much fuel, thinking they're looking for us all night. They come over the hill. They're, they're like, oh. There they oh, are. so they were just burning fuel, but you they thought were, they didn't see us. They thought they didn't. I didn't. They didn't see us. So we're like chucking gas on the fire, right. and like running around. They've come by a couple times, but they're not picking us up. I, I said to the other guys, "There's another jerry can at the far end of the lake." I'm like, "You guys go start a fire at the far end on the ledge. I'll keep this one going." They run because when you're standing next to the fire, you can't see how much um, light you're throwing. Right. So when we when they ran to the other side, they looked back and then I threw gasoline on it, and they said both these peaks, this one and the one we're on, just went like. <laughs> like, yeah. lit up like Christmas trees and I'm like why are they starting the fire and they're running back to me and I'm like what are you idiots doing like if they go to the next valley we're going to be here all night like I thought they were going to like yeah. it, was a, it was a search pattern that they yeah. were going and uh, so they uh, they come running over and um, and I'm like idiots what are you doing and they're like don't worry they see us <laughs> yeah, <laughs> there's no way they didn't see us and the guy said they said they saw us in about 45 seconds the first like as soon as they crested the hill Poof, the two bound peaks lit up. And I said to them after, I said, like, I don't want to be critical, and I, this is not a criticism, but next time what I would do is flick my light maybe and yeah. just be like, hey, yeah. we see you, because we were about to start getting desperate yeah. to, like, but then again, like, I've got a, I still have a battery. I could have just gone in the helicopter, turned on 12150, and gone, hey, guys, and they would have said, we'll be in in 35 minutes, you know, we we'll burn, burn off some fuel, right? Yeah. So they come in and they land. They tried uh, putting it in a position where they were going to winch us in. And I'm kind of like, well, they should just, this lake is so thick. They should just tow in on the lake. So I ran out to the middle of the lake and waved them. And they, they went, oh, okay, that's, the whole lake's thick. So they came down, towed in. Sartex jump out. They come running over. Are you guys okay? Yeah, we're okay. Anybody hurt? No. Just cold? Like, yeah. And they're like, all right, let's go. Like, get in the helicopter. It's freezing out here. And so, you know, that whole, like, um, that whole um, leave everything behind, don't take anything with you, like, <laughs> that doesn't apply to getting rescued. But it's a mentality of like, bagok, like chickens, like we just, we ran to the helicopter and we left our wallets, or our, our <laughs> keys, we left, like, we, <laughs> we just abandoned all of our gear. We yeah. could have just gone and picked up our bags and like, so um, we get in the helicopter, uh, there's a kind of a funny story of me trying to get in the helicopter, uh, because they're towed in, their landing gear is extended. I guess there's a door guy, and his job is to watch the tail and the door. His job's not to help you. And so I, like, jump in, and I'm, like, kind of, like, uh, uh, and I'm sliding out. And I'm, like, finally, I'm, like, I got one leg up, and I'm about to fall out of the helicopter back on the snow. And I think to myself, like, just fall out and start again. And the guy's just kind of sitting there watching me, and all of a sudden I feel, like, a hand on my butt. And I'm, like, oh, I can do <laughs> <laughs> like crawled myself into the helicopter and then pulled everybody else out. As soon as they shut the door, I just also went and it pressurized and started to heat up. I just went, yeah. like all of a sudden it just hit me like, and they're like stuffing me with uh, heat packs and stuff like that. They're like, uh, so uh, we're going to take you guys to Abbotsford. And I'm like, wow, could, could you drop us at Pitt Meadows? Like our cars are right <laughs> down there. And they're like, we're going to, Take you to Abbotsford, is that okay? And I'm like, ah, could you do Boundary Bay maybe? Like, one of the cars is there. And they're like, we're going to take you to Abbotsford, is, is that okay? And I'm like, I don't understand. <laughs> like, <laughs> you're asking me if that's okay. It is, it's totally cool. But like, and then I realized that they're on an IFR, they're going back to IFR and they have to go into an IFR airport at night. So I was like, yeah, like, whatever. And so they land. I, I think they're going to yell at you and give you shit and tell you you're idiots and all that stuff. And they shut down. The captain comes back and he's like, Dude, that rink is sick. <laughs> when are you going to get that finished? And I'm like, I don't even know if I'm going to work on this anymore. And he's like, no, man, you got to finish that rink. If you get that done by Friday, we'll try to tra schedule a training mission. We'll come up and play. And I'm like, oh. yeah. like That's awesome. They were like, and they were just like, guys, like, this is our job, and this is what we do. And next time, like, th they said this was, like, a really good training exercise. This was, like, this was just kind of, like, locate the subject, um, you know, um, Sartex, and like, this was like a great training mission for us sort of thing. Like, this is what we do. Next time you're in this position, flip the LT. 
Like, yeah. don't, don't, don't be a hero. You, you don't get charged for this. I don't take any pride in the fact that I got rescued. Um, you know what I mean? Like, I, I don't wear it as a badge of honor. I haven't told the story, but I think there's a lot of value in it because I learned a lot. The bottom line, you went from having an exciting, awesome, fun day to within less than six hours thinking you were going to die. Thinking I was going to die. Like, yeah. literally, I was concerned for my life. That's how fast it happens, and that's <laughs> why we need to know we have proper equipment and we're prepared with a plan. Uh, and I mean, I, you guys did a lot of things right, and obviously did some things wrong, but lots, me, lots of learning. Let me tell you one thing that I learned about my survival kit when I cracked that open. I was packing around about 25 pounds of dried food. I could have lived up um, right down there. That was our spot, right against that hill. Yeah. I could have lived up here for a solid week on my own with how much food I had. Or your frozen body could have been having a nice pillow <laughs> of food. Exactly. Yeah. But this pelican, pelican case, which weighs pounds, had food that weighs a lot of pounds, and I had the cheapest, flimsiest survival gear uh, that you could ever imagine. I, I remember cursing that silver blanket, thinking if only this thing was substantial, I think I would live. So when your helicopter doesn't start because it's so incredibly cold and you go back the next day and it's still like minus 10 and you can't get the thing started, this is what it feels like to get the helicopter started. Thanks for watching. Yeah!